The Atlanta is one of the latest and largest class of container ships. Known as Post Panamax, she and her kind are too wide to sail through the Panama Canal. If she were a naval vessel, she'd be the equivalent of an aircraft carrier with a crew of several thousand men. The Atlanta has a crew of just 22, ranging from a handful of ordinary seamen who work to keep the Atlanta ship shape at all times. Five engineers keep the ship's engines, power plants, and operating systems up and running. And a team of four officers work in shifts around the clock. Junior officers stand watch and keep a close eye on the weather. Second officer, Law, is responsible for navigation and communications. First officer, Jonathan, oversees all the crew, the safety, and daily running of the ship and all cargo loads. At the team's head is a captain who's spent all his working life at sea. Starboard 10. Starboard 10. Captain Roger Llewellyn is a man with salt water coursing through his veins. And over the years, he's developed some interesting sleeping habits. One eye open, always. We sleep with one eye open because at 25, 26 knots, you got to jump out and up there. Up there is the bridge, and that's where the sailor who never sleeps has spent most of his last 30 years. He's sailed every ocean on the planet and visited every nation that borders the sea. Right now, the Atlanta is in the Malacca Straits, heading from Port Kalang, Malaysia, to Singapore, then north to Hong Kong. It's a hectic schedule on a crowded route. Zero five zero. Zero five zero. A lot of traffic not doing what they're supposed to do, a lot of traffic not reporting. So you've got to have eyes at the back of your head. You've got to keep an eye out for everything moving, especially small coastal traffic. We've got one here, not reported, you see. He's trying to get across the bow. When the Atlanta blows her horn, you'd be well advised to move out of her way. Her vital statistics are staggering. From bow to stern, the Atlanta is 323 meters long. That's over a thousand feet. In fact, if you could tip the Atlanta up on her bow, she'd edge out the Eiffel Tower. The area of her top deck is greater than two football fields. Fully laden, the Atlanta weighs more than 300 jumbo jets. On her normal route, she carries cargo from Southeast Asia to the west coast of America and back again every 42 days. These ocean giants make the Earth very small. It is a village, because one minute we're in the east, next minute we're in the west. Very little time between the two. So we're constantly plying the world with manufactured goods. Mega ships like the Atlanta help keep the wheels of global commerce turning. Over half the world's cargo is carried in containers. In one year, nearly 20 million containers are moved a total of 300 million times. It's a payload worth almost $5 trillion. The Atlanta may be loaded down, but she still has to be on time. She runs to schedule for thousands and thousands of miles. She'll arrive on time. In Singapore, containers are arriving from all around the region. Some have a date with the Atlanta. These transfers must be planned with military precision. It's a chain where a weak link means a cargo gets delayed, or even worse, lost. The bottom line, the cargo must be at port waiting when the Atlanta docks. Two particular pieces of cargo due for the Atlanta started their journey several thousand kilometers away in Australia. One is precious and fragile, a shipment of 999 cartons of wine from the lush vineyards of South Australia. The other is also a gourmet delight, but this time highly perishable. 
a container load of sweet, succulent prawns. Both the wine and seafood are bound for shops and restaurants in Hong Kong, and both will require extreme care and constant supervision. The Atlantas do in Singapore in less than 24 hours, but there's a problem. Third mate. Oh, yes, that's correct, over. Third mate. Yeah, I'll see Atlanta, the master here. I sent it yesterday and I sent it again this morning when I left Port Galen. Okay, uh, Roger, but so far we've not received it. Port procedures are very strict. Yeah. I give up. Without the right paperwork, ships can't enter a country's waters. Good mate, keep him there, tell him. Instead of the last 10 ports which you've already got, I'll just send you Port Kalang. OK, no problem, no problem. Aye, aye. The captain must keep to schedule. He has 2,200 containers to move in Singapore. And he must get there on time. The Atlanta is steaming towards Singapore Harbor and the planned 2,200 container moves. This megaship is purpose-built for one thing only, to carry cargo. A mountain of cargo. All up, she can carry 8,063 20-foot containers. These are the lashing bars and the turn muffles up. These are 20 foot. You can load 20s, and you can load 40s, either or. But they still need lashing forward and aft. Keep them fixed in position. Even though she hasn't yet reached her full load capacity, the captain still likes to check on the containers from the top to the very bottom. Where we are now, we're 13.6 metres underwater now. Down here, the containers are stacked nine high. So they go nine high, and then on deck, another six to eight high. So roughly, we're stacking 17 high. From the very bottom of the stack, over 13 meters below the water, the containers rise over 44 meters. On land, it would look like a city block rising 10 stories. If laid end to end, those containers would stretch further than an Olympic marathon nearly 50 kilometers. A little over 40 years ago, it was a different story. Products like wine would have been transported in a variety of simple boxes, and moving frozen foods over long distances was simply out of the question. Then, in the late 50s, an American, Malcolm McLean, came up with an idea that would revolutionize world trade by packing all goods into modular containers similar in design and dimension they could be easily transported anywhere in the world by road, rail, or sea. As the use of these containers has grown, so has the size of the ships that carry them. The Atlanta is one of 12 SX-class ships built for OOCL by the Samsung Shipyard in Korea. It took over 8,000 workers nearly nine months to build her at a cost of over $150 million. She is the largest ship ever ever built when she was contracted. And uh, she had been installed the largest main engine when uh, available in that time. For the engine power that he was given, for the speed he won, he's done, a, for me, a great job. When first launched, the SX class held the world record as the largest container ship ever built. We used the high tensile steel to get the minimum large ship weight so that we can maximize the cargo loading capability. It's that combination of high tensile steel and the design of the hull that gives the Atlanta her enormous load carrying ability. This that runs the full length of the ship is a very important structural member for stresses, because you must remember there's so many big openings that the ship is bending all the time. 
in this area, when you've got 95,000 horsepower pushing this ship, the pressure is enormous. You can see that the, the frame structure is very heavy. So this is a high stress area, especially in heavy weather. The real pride of the Atlanta is the power plant. This is one of the world's biggest diesel engines. A 12-cylinder turbocharged monster. Its sheer size is breathtaking. The engine fills a room six stories high, six stories of incredible power. The engine peaks at 104 revolutions per minute, but generates a mind-blowing 93,120 brake horsepower. That's over 700 times more power than an average family car. And all that power adds up to one thing, speed through the water. She can average nearly 25 nautical miles an hour. That's fast enough to water ski behind, as long as you can handle that huge stern wash. While at sea, the Atlanta can notch up over 570 nautical miles a day. But a speed like that comes at a price. This ship, she burns a lot of fuel. Full speed, she'll burn 230, 240 tons a day. That's a staggering 10 tons of diesel every hour the ship is underway. She may be thirsty, but she's also a clean engine. And that starts with clean fuel. A series of filters remove impurities before the diesel is pumped into a holding tank and heated to 129 degrees. Hot fuel and gas is an explosive mix. Cargo hold, number seven cargo hold, the fire alarm's gone off. No other sound strikes fear into the heart of the mariner like the fire alarm. Starboard side, bay one, starboard side. Let me know A fire at sea can spell disaster. A small spark can soon become a fireball. The crew have to be ready to act in an instant. In the ocean, you're on your own, you've got nobody. We've got no shore facilities, no emergency services. We just rely on our own training and our own emergency services. But a fire is the worst. In an emergency like this, First Mate Jonathan rallies the crew. The captain calls the shots. We are now proceeding forward for investigation. Aye, aye. And on deck, on deck, please. Getting it right can mean the difference between survival and disaster. Those are ready. Okay, I'm going to start the emergency fire pump. I got me that. The crew have to work together closely. When the emergency pumps come on, they come on strong. Seawater is pumped onto a fire at a rate of over 4,000 liters per minute through high pressure hoses. Training every Saturday afternoon, two hours of training every Saturday. We have uh, fire drills forward, galley, accommodation, all over the ship. Within a space of three months, we'll have covered every part of the ship in a fire drill. And 95% of all fires at sea are in the engine room. Maybe down at the CO2 room, the CO2 room, you read over? Still copy. Each week, the Atlanta's crew carry out an intensive fire drill. A fire in the engine room is the most dangerous of all. 